Today's episode was sponsored by Echo over on Patreon. A while ago. I'm sorry, Echo, that it took this long. They have been very, very kind with their patience. But um, thank you so much, Echo. And uh, let's go ahead and get this bad boy up on the wall, shall we? Yeah! So, uh, yeah, here it is, up on the wall. And um, also, my cat's here now. Say thank you, Echo. Thank you, Echo. I'm just kidding. Doodle doesn't talk. He's strong and silent. Sincerely, though, thank you, Echo. I really want to thank them for their patience. They bought this patch a month ago and I believe gave me extra money to, to purchase it. So I, I really appreciate that. I, 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 I wish I was better at this. And I'm very lucky that I have such nice people who support me. I asked Echo if they had any special shout outs they wanted me to give, and they did. So um, let me read that out here. Um, I. Oh. But yeah, Echo said that they got this in celebration of finally graduating college after five long years of physical and mental health struggles, and because they just picked their new name, which I was thinking this the entire time. Echo is a great name. Well picked. They go on to say, shout out to anyone struggling with their own health or coming to terms with their own identities. Your road may be a little longer and more difficult than you hoped for or expected, but you've got this, you will get there, and I believe in you. That is an awesome message, although I I'm not sure if anyone watching this is struggling with their own health or coming to terms with their identities. That seems, that doesn't seem like a relatable issue. I think, I think that's just a you problem, Echo. So it's a nice thought, but I'm not sure that that beautiful message will help anyone. I feel I need to say this just to be clear, that was sarcasm. Yeah, I just, I just can't leave nice moments nice. But seriously, listen to Echo. I, that's as good as I've ever heard it put. And um, yeah, thank you. Let's get on with the episode. At the moment I'm recording this, my most viewed video of the year is something that begins with the phrase, this homophobic Christian movie, dot, dot, dot. And recently, as I was scrolling through my recommended YouTube videos, I found another video that begins with the phrase, this homophobic Christian movie, about a different homophobic Christian movie than the one I talked about before. And pretty much the second I saw the thumbnail for that, I knew that I was gonna make a video about this movie because it feels like a no-brainer. My last video on the topic got views and my channel is currently in dire need of views, so Frankly, it just makes sense. That said though, I do believe in credit where credit is due, so I want to acknowledge the creator who beat me to the punch. Their name is Justice Corsgard, and while I did not watch their video because I didn't want it influencing this, based solely on their titles, it stands to reason that if you like me, you'll probably like them, so go check them out. Justice, if you're watching this for some reason, I deeply apologize for what I'm sure was a horrible mispronunciation of your name. But yeah, the homophobic movie I'm talking about this time is called A Taste of Praise. And it's pretty much just the homophobic movie I talked about last time, you know? A man stands up for his belief in traditional marriage, and his life and business suffer as a result. Where this one differed, though, is that I actually found myself agreeing with the homophobe occasionally. That sounded bad. To be clear, he is ultimately still a backwards asshole who is wrong. But the various straw man situations he endures in the name of his beliefs do feel a little bit more complicated to me than they seem like they should be on paper. And what makes things even more complicated is the fact that this plot actually happened in real life. Well, 
No, actually, that's probably not true. I feel very confident that what's happening on screen bears very little resemblance to how things played out IRL, but still, it's hard to deny that a taste of praise was at least inspired by actual events. We first meet our protagonist at a dance recital as two ballerinas prance around on stage. And I'm not gonna lie, for a homophobic movie, this is a pretty gay way to start things out. The reason he's there is that one of those dancers is his daughter, I don't remember which one. And so after they finish performing, he meets her backstage and celebrates her show as any parent would by wheeling out an elaborate three-tiered wedding cake. And again, pretty gay. I mean, obviously this part is meant to establish the fact that the main guy is a baker, but given the plot of this movie, I feel like the fact that the first thing we see him make is a pretty pink ballerina cake complete with tutu is not not worth pointing out. If you haven't put it together yet, this movie seems to be based on the real world legal battles in which Christian bakers refused to make cakes for same-sex weddings, claiming that it was a violation of their First Amendment rights. And because the First Amendment is freedom of expression, there's a lot of talk about how the main dude's cakes are an expression of himself. You know, I'm, I'm an artist, so to force me to make and bake a cake that goes against my faith is to compel me to engage in speech that I don't agree with. So with that in mind, it does feel odd to me that the first thing we see this homophobe express himself with is something that is so deeply f I guess when I pictured them in my head, all the bigoted bakers in the real world were women, because something about a homophobic male wedding cake maker doesn't really add up to me. I mean, obviously men can pursue whatever they want. It's 2016. But that said, I think it's fair to say that this particular pursuit is traditionally viewed as more feminine. Him breaking into the wedding industry probably would have required him to shed a certain amount of toxic masculinity. And the fact that he did that and still came out the other end as a homophobe feels strange. After you watch him roll in a big pink frilly cake, you don't really expect him to turn around and be like, ew, two boys. And I honestly think that might be intentional. It very much feels like the filmmakers are doing what they can to make things as gay as possible in these earlier scenes. Aside from the cake and the extended dance sequence, I think the case could be made that the first line of dialogue is spoken by a gay man. Now it's subtle, but I think that the daughter's ballet instructor is being queer coded. It very much feels like the world they're trying to establish here is the world that conservative Christians seem to believe exists when they try to argue against gay marriage. It's a world where we all just get along and live in harmony. You know, we may not all agree with each other, but as long as we keep our business to ourselves, then everything's fine. We watch the main dude give cake to a gay dude, and the gay dude is really happy about it, and it all feels designed to let you know right up top that just because he doesn't believe in same-sex marriage, that doesn't mean that he hates gay people. Provided you think that the dance instructor is gay, which, come on. Oh my god, I just want to thank you, sir. Is this just delicious or what? Uh, we're gonna find out. Thank you so much. And you know, if that were the world we lived in, then I'd be fine with it, but... Unfortunately, I don't think that it is. For one thing, I don't think that the whole we love gay people, we just don't approve of gay marriage thing is possible. If you follow the logic of what people are saying when they say that, then there's honestly something kind of sinister about it. If they really believe that hell is as horrible as they say, then I don't think that they can say that they love gay people if they're just going to sit back and watch them doom themselves to it. I'm well past the point in my life where I'm willing to have friends who say they're against same-sex marriage, but in a world where I did, if they weren't doing everything they could to get me into conversion therapy, then I'm not gonna lie, I'd be a little bit offended. Uh, like, fuck my soul, I guess. 
It also bugs me when Christians try to play the whole we don't have to agree to get along bullshit because I feel like it implies that when issues arise, it's because other people have decided that they can't just let things be. And that is very rarely actually the case. And to show you what I mean, why don't I just jump ahead to where the actual story begins as two men enter our protagonist's bakery. Gentlemen, welcome to Ovation Cakes. How can I help you? Hello, I am Frank Fullerton with Advanced Creative Designs. Nice to meet you, Frank. And I'm William Park. I'm an accountant at the Cellus Prospect and Park. Why did they say what they do? Well, so how can I help you? We need a doozy. I need something fabulous. <laughs> okay. Uh, something that's just going to knock the socks off of our guests. I need a custom creative cake. Uh, not anything too crazy, but something spectacular. Uh, not something too tall to where it's going to tumble or too <laughs> short. It's going to be bland. Right. I just give me wow. Representation matters. I, we can do wow. I want this one to be for the books, if you know what I mean. I, I think I do know Insert what you mean. Insert money's no object, okay. just as long as it is baked into my cake. Great, okay, so what's the occasion? Well, it's a wedding between two humans that are madly in love. So Frank and William together forever. forever. You can tell that this movie isn't as c'est la vie as it seems to think it is just by the way that that played out. Because normally when a baker asks you what the cake is for, you'd be like, oh, we're getting married. Here though, it seems like they're trying to create suspense. They slowly build to the reveal while tense music plays in the background. It honestly feels like something out of a horror movie. I can't view this scene with the eyes of an evangelical Christian, but I do think there's a chance that the way those two guys are pawing at each other is meant to be shocking to this film's intended audience, you know? They come into this sweet man's bakery and just flaunt that lifestyle right in his face. And like, whatever, if you think that gay men are scary, that's fine. Lord knows that I do. But if that's the case, then I think you should just admit it. And this movie does not seem like it's willing to do that. It still wants to try and be all, we don't have anything against gay people, we just disagree with the lifestyle. So it has the main dude be homophobic in the chillest way possible. First of all, congratulations thank you, thank to you guys, you. sincerely. Unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to make your cake. But I, why? Uh, it's just, I, I don't do custom cakes for same-sex couples. Explain yourself. It's, uh, it's just an agreement that I made with God. Okay, I'm not sure how sincere his congratulations really were, given that he immediately followed them with, I'm so against what you're doing that I made a promise to the Almighty that I never associate myself with it in any way. And that's really what's frustrating about A Taste of Praise. It seems so wrapped up in trying to make its side seem like the reasonable one, that it never quite feels like it's saying what it actually wants to say. And then a, an agreement that you made with God? Yes, sir. You can't discriminate. What? Is homosexual is not good enough to come in here and get one of your cakes? No, 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 no. What is it? You hate gay people. No, I, guys, I, I don't, I don't hate anyone. Okay? It's just, I'm, look, I love to help you out. No, 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 no. Finish your sentence. I feel like I don't hate anyone, it's just is this film's entire argument. But it never actually says what comes next. And I feel like that's because they know that they can't do it without sounding like a bit of an asshole. And it's like, just be an asshole. That's all right. I mean, it's not, but you are allowed to be one. I will be honest, when I first heard about the real world incident that inspired this, I was reluctantly on the side of the homophobic baker because in my head, it played out, well, exactly as the movie portrays it. I, I know some bakers here in town. No, no, no. I want an ovation cake. I'm sorry. Listen. Make the cake, or I'm going to sue your silly little butt 
all the way to your high flute in heaven. Will you please reconsider? He's got a lot of influence. Look, I understand how he No, you don't. But you will here in a few days. My initial thoughts on the whole wedding cake drama were that yes, the baker should probably just pull the stick out of their ass and make the damn cake. But if they didn't want to do that, then they shouldn't have been forced to do so. I've tried to put myself in the position of being told that someone didn't condone my wedding so they wouldn't make my cake, and I'm not gonna lie, it would hurt. But I think I would probably just take that hurt out their door to another bakery. I wouldn't sue because that sounds exhausting, and I certainly wouldn't force someone to make me a cake if they really didn't want to, because no matter how much I disagree with them, that still sounds like kind of a shitty thing to do. Of course, this was never actually about forcing someone to make a cake. And after watching this, I feel silly that I ever thought it was. Because this movie super thinks that the issue here is that a gay couple really wanted a specific baker to make their cake. And when that baker refused, they decided that the only way they were going to get what they want was through a drawn out legal battle. And when you actually watch that scenario play out on screen, it does not take long to realize how ridiculous it is. For one thing, the cakes don't really look that good. The movie wants us to believe that the main dude is some master of his craft. Oh, oh, Mr. Marquette, you've all done yourself. This, this is gonna be the highlight of the party. I can't wait to see mom and dad's reaction. But most of the things we see him make look like something you could have gotten at a Safeway. Probably because the set decorator more than likely got them at a Safeway. Still, even if you understood the hype, watching someone be like, I'm gonna get that cake or I'll see your ass in court, feels so cartoonishly over the top that it makes you think that it probably didn't happen. I guess I don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, I'd say that the gay couple in real life forgot about the cake part of things pretty quickly and were instead driven by the immense pain they must have felt when they went into a bakery to try and celebrate their love, only to be greeted with homophobia. Unlike me, they weren't exhausted by the idea of standing up for themselves, so they decided to report the issue to try and make it so that nobody else would feel that pain in the future. And when I look at it through that lens, I do actually start to feel like the gay couple isn't just morally right. They're right. Full stop. I truly don't think that anyone should be forced to make a cake that they don't want to, but I think that the alternative is much worse because it sets a very bad precedent. Saying you don't have to serve one group of people opens the door to saying that you don't have to serve other groups of people. And that just leads straight back to certain policies from the 1950s that we fought very hard to get rid of. Even if you say it's only on religious ground, I feel like it's only a matter of time. The, the way things are going, some church somewhere is going to declare that Christianity is only for white people any day now. I think that bakers should be allowed to signal to people that they're not about that gay shit, you know? Maybe hang a cross in a window or put up a scarecrow dressed in Ed Hardy to try and ward off homosexuals, but. If for some reason a same-sex couple ignores those signs and comes into your store, then you should provide them with every service that you would if they were mixed sex. That said, homosexuals maybe don't ignore those signs if you see them. If not for your own safety or your mental health, then do it because you really shouldn't work with someone if they've made it clear that they don't wanna. Like, yes, they are dickish, but Forcing them to do something they don't want to is also dickish, and two dickishes don't make... I don't know how to finish that sentence. Although the way I'm talking about it implies that people are always going to have options, and that's not really the case, which is ultimately why I think laws like this are necessary. Maybe you live in a small town with only one baker. I mean, if that is you... 
I'd suggest using the money you were going to spend on your gay wedding to move somewhere with a baker who's not homophobic instead, but... If for some reason you really want to stay where you are, then I think you should be entitled to the same services as everyone else. And having rambled about laws for about a page and a half now, I do feel like I should probably take a moment to point out that I am not a lawyer, I, I have no clue what I'm talking about, and I am simply giving my opinion on the matter. Uh, which, spoiler, the Supreme Court does not seem to agree with me on. It'll be a while before we get there, though. Before we do, we have to watch as the main dude's decision creates problems for him and those around him. Because he's not the only person who suffers consequences. His family does, too. And that's honestly really sad, because they seem like such a nice group of people. I mean, look at how happy they are. They're dancing in the middle of the day. Whoa, what's this? A dance party? I'm in. Let's go. All right. You are a rock star. I yeah. bet all the girls loved you. What an odd thing to say to your father. After that little hootenanny, the main dude pulls his wife into the kitchen and explains the situation to her. And despite now being in the privacy of his own home, it feels like he's trying very hard not to offend anyone. One of the partners from your firm came into the showroom this afternoon and uh, wants me to bake him a custom wedding cake. Uh, Mr. William Park. Mm. Oh yeah, he's a nice guy. Yeah. Who's getting married? Uh, Frank Fullerton. Don't know him. <clears throat> yeah, well, I've got a feeling you're about to. Who's the bride? Mr. William Park. You can tell that straight people are trying to be respectful because they choose their words very carefully as though they're worried they'll get in trouble if they say something wrong. And on one hand, good for him, ally. On the other, though, it feels very weird. These people are suing him, so it seems like he should be a little bit angrier than that. Uh, like, don't call them the F-slur, but you can call them assholes. This scene again feels like it was designed to hide what the movie is actually trying to say. I think for that, you have to listen to the background music, which is a choice. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, should I just, should I call him and and tell him that I'll do it? No. We agreed to keep God's promise that we would not compromise in our business. He saved us, rescued us, prospered us. He gave us two beautiful children. When I was gathering clips for this video. I had to check my iTunes multiple times because that music feels so far into the scene that it's in that I genuinely thought I had left a Sufjan Stevens song playing in the background. It's very melancholy, and I think the reason they forced it in there was to make sure that the audience knows that we're supposed to feel sad for these people. The sad strings paired with the non-aggressive tone that the couple is speaking in makes them seem like these poor innocent puppies who are under attack even though they'd never heard a fly. And because of that, when one of the gays gets angry at the wife, he seems like the crazy one. There's nothing to talk about, Anna. I need you to understand why Danny said no. I was mortified. I've never been treated like that in a place of business before. Look, I know Danny. He would never disrespect you. He straight up discriminated against both of us. Did you even hear what he said? Why he can't make your cake? I gotta go back to work. Mortified? But the way he refused you service based on your sexual orientation was so sweet. That clip is yet another instance of them not finishing their sentence when they're explaining why the baker did what he did, which... Again, feels like a pretty important part of this film's argument. To be fair, the movie does make it clear what the end of that sentence would be many times. It's that it goes against the dude's faith. But I think that there's a reason that they avoid saying that to the gay couple. 
And that's because there's no way to do that without seeming kind of cruel. Oh gosh, no, my husband wasn't trying to offend you. All he was saying was that he thinks your relationship is evil and that you and the person you love most in the world are destined for hell. Does that make sense? Honestly, the more I think about it, the more pissed off I get at the calm tone the homophobes speak in. The movie's trying to make them seem reasonable, but after a while, it just comes off as condescending. The way that lady is speaking to that sodomite, it makes it seem like she thinks that this is some big misunderstanding that she just needs to clear up, and it's like, no, I think everyone gets what you're saying, that, that doesn't mean that they have to like it. It's not just the wife who suffers the consequences of the main dude's actions. His decision to not make the cake affects his daughter's life, too. Dad! Dad! What? Mr. Atwood changed his mind. He gave the role of Ophelia to Stephanie. He said it's time for equity and diversity to take center stage. Whatever that means. <gasps> that poor girl! I hope those homosexuals burn for what they did to her. In all seriousness, though, while I wouldn't say that not getting the lead role in the school play is the worst fate someone suffers in this movie, I do think that there's something kind of fucked up about it. The implication here is that what her dad did offended her teacher so much that he took his frustrations out on her, and I think that that's not okay. If you're an educator, you should not punish your students for things that their parents did. Also, not for nothing, but the way she describes it, her teacher sounds like a real Quietly casting someone else is one thing, but going up to your student and saying it's time for equity and diversity to take center stage feels actively hostile in a way that I don't think teachers should be. If this were to happen in real life, I would be firmly on the student's side, but I'm not sure that it did. At least not as the movie portrays it. The sense I get watching this is that it was written by someone who has taken a very bare-bones bullet point list of what actually happened, and then conservified each individual event so that it fits their narrative. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were actually some daughter somewhere who were removed from the lead role of a school play as the result of her parents' homophobia. My hunch is that it was less the decision of a pissy drama teacher, and more the decision of a principal who was like, we're caught in the middle of a very intense legal battle, and we want to stay neutral, so maybe don't give the daughter of the guy getting sued the lead, because that looks like we're picking a side. Based on what I've heard from teachers, I have a very hard time believing that one of them would go up to a student in this situation and be like, listen here, missy, because that sounds like it could turn into a huge headache for them but particularly if they already know that the student's parents have lawyers. Speaking of which... Well, clearly this is a First Amendment case. Free speech, religious freedom. But there is a big hurdle. <laughs> I can jump. <laughs> okay, but the commission leans left. They don't like your position on faith or your politics. Yes, if there's anyone who hates the First Amendment, it's a bunch of liberals on a civil rights commission. The lawyer agrees to take on the main dude's case, but says that until the trial, he needs to change the way he operates his business. All right. Let's see how this goes. But in the meantime, I don't want you to make any custom wedding cakes for anyone. That's 50% of my business. The good news, they will rule quickly. And I kind of feel like that clip solves the entire movie. Like at first I heard that and thought, yeah, that does suck for him. He's losing half his business. But then I thought about it a little longer and felt like that's probably just how he should do things all the time. Like, I kind of feel like this whole thing is as simple as if you don't feel comfortable making cakes for gay weddings then don't become a wedding cake maker, because gay weddings are weddings now. In my exhausting need to play devil's advocate, I tried to look at the slippery slope that might be created if this dude were told that he just had to make the damn cake. And the place that that took me was like, okay, but 
What if the cake that they wanted was topped with an extremely graphic depiction of two men having sex? And you know, I do think that he probably shouldn't be forced to make such a thing. But that said, if he were willing to make a cake topped with an extremely graphic depiction of a man and a woman having sex, then I think he should have to make the gay one if someone asks. I have no problem with him being like, you know what? No extremely graphic sex cakes. But once you've established yourself as willing to make an extremely graphic sex cake, then you should not discriminate what kind of extremely graphic sex cake you make based on the kind of extremely graphic sex your customer prefers. I think that this movie thinks that it's about a sacrifice that this man is making in the name of his faith, but I would honestly argue that it's about his unwillingness to make a sacrifice. His goal here isn't so much refusing to mold to a world that wants him to go against his beliefs, it's about him trying to mold the world around him to fit his beliefs. And frankly, even if I thought that he was making a sacrifice, I still wouldn't think that the price he paid was that bad. Outside of the loss of business, which would admittedly suck, I think that the worst thing that happens to this guy is some light vandalism. And believe me, when I say light, I mean light. Bake this hater? I'm not sure, but I'm fairly certain that that's frosting. Or, or at the very least, if it is a pain of some sort, it's one that wipes away just as easily as frosting. And what's odd is that despite the fact that you probably could get that van looking spotless with like 30 seconds of light squeegeeing, when we next see it, the vandalism has been covered with brown papers suggesting that they are either being dramatic or that they are very bad at cleaning. And yeah, outside of that vicious frosting attack, the only other noteworthy thing that happens to him is that people protest his store. Shut them down! Shut them down! And I'd say that this were bad for business, but I'm not sure that it is. From what we see, it also leads to customers going into the store for the sole purpose of protesting the protesters. Hey. Sorry about all this. I support you. I'd like some cupcakes, please. And um, a birthday cake. Either that lady is very high or the only reason she went into that store was to support its politics. The movie tries to make the protests seem worse by having the guy's daughter get involved, but... Well, I still wouldn't call them harrowing, exactly. Hey, no one you want to tell him! We're gonna shut this place down! We're gonna shut this place down! I'm not saying I'd enjoy getting pushed, but I still think she's overreacting just a little bit there. Especially because I'm not even sure that she was pushed. It kind of just looks like that woman bumped into her, which would make sense because that girl has very much inserted herself in the direct center of that protest. I'm frankly impressed that they managed to avoid her for as long as they did. This protest is clearly meant to strike fear in the hearts of the audience and make them think, look, they're after our kids. But for me, the most shocking part was not her falling on her butt, it was this. Uh, hey, hi, um, yeah, this is Danny Marcotte. Um, I, I, I own uh, Ovation Cakes. I got a bunch of 
protesters out in front of my place. Could you please send someone over here? Sir, are they being violent or threatening or trespassing on your property? Well, I mean, they, they're blocking my door and they're intimidating my customers. Well, they do have the right to assemble and protest on a public sidewalk, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, well, what about my right to run a business? When you stop to think about it, that is a very strange thing for a person to do when they're in the middle of a lawsuit about the First Amendment. I'm gonna jump ahead to the end now, but after the guy wins his case, he celebrates as any baker would by making a cake of the First Amendment. And there, written on the second tier in frosting, clear as day, is freedom of assembly. Which feels a wee bit hypocritical. Watching him celebrate the First Amendment after he's made a phone call trying to break up a protest makes me think that he's not really celebrating the First Amendment at all. He's just celebrating the fact that he got his way. And you know what? That's understandable. That's ultimately what everyone wants, to be what you are and do what you want without having that be impeded by anyone else. And frankly, I want that for everyone. Even if I don't agree with you on everything, I sincerely hope that you get to do whatever you want. Unfortunately though, things aren't always that simple. The sad fact of the matter is that sometimes what you want and what I want are diametrically opposed. So when those things come into contact with one another, just letting everybody do their own thing isn't really an option. Eventually, someone is going to wander into the wrong bakery and nobody is going to be fully happy. And when that happens, we all need to figure out how to move forward. And that's what a lot of law is. It's rules to navigate situations where being civil to one another is a lot more complicated than just saying, you do you and I'll do me. And that can be very difficult to figure out sometimes. There's a reason that it takes a lot of work to be a lawyer, and that's because the law is way too complicated for some asshole on the street like me to try and figure out all the intricacies. Do we have a right to have someone make us a cake if it goes against their beliefs? I truly don't know. I can see both sides of the argument, and while I'm obviously partial to one of them, I think the discussion is important because I don't think that anyone's religious liberty should be infringed upon. And that, more than the homophobia, is what pissed me off the most about this movie. Because it really does not seem to think that there's a discussion to be had. It clearly thinks that the gays are the villains here, which... whatever, fine, but... Again, if that's the case, then fucking say it. I would respect this movie 1000% more if every other line out of the protagonist's mouth was a hateful slur. But instead it tries to toe this weird line where it clearly thinks it's being respectful, which is just so much more frustrating. We're under attack becomes we respect you, why can't you respect us? And that makes arguing the issue that much more complicated because that's super not what the situation is. Nowadays, conservatives want to act like gay rights are as simple as I say potato, you say potato. But really, it's more like I say potato, you push harmful legislation that negatively impacts my life. I think if the movie were to honestly finish the sentence it starts many times, it would sound something like, we don't hate anyone, we just wish that gay people didn't exist. And there's not really a way to respect that without fucking over gay people. We are at odds with one another, and that's fine. We don't need to come together and sing a song, we just need to do our best to try and not step on each other's toes, which complicates things, because some people already are. I think the reason conservatives are so quick to say let's all stay in our lanes is because their lane has always been bigger. It's been bleeding into the rest of our lanes for ages now, and they don't even realize it. And that's really the root of conservatism. They like things the way they are, and they want to keep them that way. And unfortunately, that makes getting what they want pretty easy, because when all you're fighting for is for things to stay the same, then the best way to fight is by convincing the world that there's no fight to be had. Their sense of self is rooted in their desire to preserve the world as they perceive it. And because of that, 
They view any attempt to change the world as an attempt to change them. And that feels like an attack. Honestly, it's a lot like cake. Kinda. Not really. This is not about to be my most artful metaphor, but as we come to the end of the video, I need a way to tie things together, so bear with me. But yeah, imagine there's this bakery, and every day it gives out a cake. For the longest time, you were the only person who showed up, so you got the entire thing. Not, not, not sure why this bakery does this. It sounds like a bad business practice, but maybe the owner is independently wealthy and just likes to make people happy. Now imagine if after years of getting the whole cake, someone else came along and asked for a slice. It would probably feel like they were taking something from you, even though that cake was never meant just for you. You only got it because nobody else spoke up. Things are obviously very complicated these days, but I genuinely think that the root of most of the world's problems is as simple as people are just set in their ways. They don't want to change. And here's the thing, I honestly don't give a fuck if people change. I just need them to learn how their staying the same affects the rest of us. I'm all for staying in our lanes, but we need to learn where our lanes are before we can do that. I don't love it when people conflate being anti-gay with their religion, but I would never want anyone to tell them that they can't. If it were up to me, that tacky ass First Amendment cake he made would have included another tier that said freedom to be an asshole, because I fully believe that is all of our right. Believe what you want, do what you want, just so long as it doesn't get in the way of me believing what I want and doing what I want, because then we have some issues. We don't have to be friends, we don't have to get along. Honestly, we don't even need to respect each other. We just all need to learn how to exist side by side in the way where we're in each other's business the least. Ultimately, I think we're all entitled to our fair slice of cake. So you eat yours over there, and so long as you don't come over and take a bite out of mine, we'll be fine. I mean that as a metaphor about equal rights and Literally, because I do not fuck around when it comes to eating cake. But yeah, that's my video. Please like and subscribe and share and comment and uh, turn on notifications and uh, follow me on Instagram. I've decided I want more Instagram followers. It's mostly just pictures of my pets, but there's a link to it below. Um, Yeah. Also, if you really want to support the channel and you have some extra money to spend, you can consider subscribing to my page. Subscribing to my Patreon. Fuck. Also, if you really want to support the channel and have some extra money to spend, you can consider subscribing to my Patreon or super thanksing me, which, speaking of, I have some super thanks to super thanks back. Let me find them. YouTube Studio app. Go to content. Go to comments. Go to blah, blah, blah. Go to contain super thanks. I responded. Thank you to Raspy Raccoon 6530, Soft Sad Boy, Sorry Sod, Tortilla Chips 3911, Tortilla Chips 3911. Tortilla Chips 3911 and Tortilla Chips 3911. Jesus, Tortilla Chips 3911. Thank you. Also, wait a while before you give me money again. You, you have done your part. Javier Jr. and Smarks 517. Uh, Five one four seven. You should get tested for dyscalculia. So thank you, and um, if you are someone who frequently super thanks me and would like a more streamlined process, I have good news. Um, so last episode, I asked people if they would be okay with me turning on memberships, and they said 
we don't think about you that much. So I'm gonna do it. Uh, it sounded like some people would like that and prefer it to Patreon. So uh, also, it seems like YouTube really wants me to do it, and usually it's like do what they say. So here's the deal. I'm gonna give you my spiel. One, do not donate to me if you will in any way miss the money that you are going to be spending. Two, I really, 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 really appreciate donations. I can't promise anything from them beyond what I will list now. So just like with Patreon, it's going to be $10 to get your name in the credits real big, and $5 to get your names in the credits real bit, slightly smaller. And then um, for $2, which is the sort of like basic thing, it's gonna be a little different because with Patreon, you get early access to videos, but the way YouTube works and with copyright stuff, that probably won't work out on uh, memberships. So I was trying to think of something that I could do there. And um, I realized there are a lot of people who like my um, live premieres and there are a lot of people who are like, I don't like that because I want to watch the video. I click in it and it's just like, I have to wait now. So I figure uh, for $2 and up, you will get access to live premieres which um, hopefully people like. I, yeah. That said, as I've always said, I don't like the idea of someone who wants to watch my content but can't because they can't afford it. So if you are someone who likes live premieres, comment below, I think I can gift memberships. So like ask yourself, can I really not afford $2 a month? And if you can't, please just say, hey, I like live premieres. I don't want to miss out. And I will do what I can to gift you a membership. And also, I don't, I, um, I think that's it. I probably should have figured this spiel out a little bit more before I committed to it. But anyway, channel memberships are on. I think there are other perks. I think your comments jump jump up to the top. I don't know, man. It's all complicated. I just am trying to justify this decision that I've made with my life. Goodbye. Hello. Uh, the video's not actually over, it's still time for... My dog just started screaming because my cat's feeder went off. Um, it's still time for the patrons' names to scroll while I pose for a thumbnail. And for this one, I think I'm gonna call it like, this homophobic Christian movie is my enemy. So, so I'll just do the same thing I always do, which like... <laughs> Oh shit, I just realized I never replugged the person whose video inspired Justice Course Guard. I've shared a link to their channel below. Go check out their take on this video. I'm realizing I haven't actually watched it, so like, like I'm assuming we're on the same side of the issue. Probably not the same side, but like, uh, like when they say homophobic in the title, I'm assuming they're viewing that as a bad thing. Um, if they're not, someone tell me, and I'll do the little. But they seem nice. Their their picture makes them seem nice. I think it's fine. What am I doing? Posing. That's not. Yeah, not bad. Get my, need to make it look like I'm not a little potato man. Or maybe if I'm calling him my enemy, I should switch things up and be like... Fight. 
No. Nothing about this movie is that egregious, so I feel like I shouldn't be like, ah! What if that's the thumbnail I use? Why are my heads behind my hand? Reverse that. Um, my coffee. Uh, just a coffee. <laughs> it's empty. Um, getting it, finding it harder and harder to justify this section because it's like I'm always wearing the same sweater because I'm always doing these stupid Christian movies. And then, um, it's like, well. I need to get one good weird picture of me that everyone recognizes, like Matt Pat, and then I'll be golden. Like, really? fuck that dude. Actually, he's he seems lovely, and I've watched more than a few of his videos. Um, what am I doing? This is why I shouldn't record in the morning. I'm a night person. Um, <sighs> ah, ah. It is hard because my monitor's there, but my camera's here. So I don't really know what I look like, what my eyes look like. I can only, like, like, this looks good when I turn my eyes, but I'm imagine, I don't know if me turning my eyes will make a massive difference. You know, I'm gonna cut this off. I am, I am sleepy. I, yeah, I love you all. Good night, morning.